The subject of the talk is uh, some of the statistical problems that have uh, arisen in uh, designing a distributed tracing system. So uh, I'll, I will spend some time on the, on the problem context, which uh, veers a little bit towards engineering, but I'll try to spend the bulk of the time on, on some of the pure statistical problems and data structures that, that we've worked on uh, in, in answering these, these challenges and, and building this product. So uh, a little bit about myself. So, Actually, I was a, a graduate student here a very long time ago, so lots of, um, lots of memories. Um, I was uh, an academic mathematician for a while. After finishing a postdoc at USC, I decided to leave for industry. Uh, for almost four years now, I've been at uh, SignalFX. We're a, a real-time uh, monitoring, monitoring and alerting solution for uh, time series data. Um, a few months ago, we were acquired by Splunk, so we're now a Splunk company. Um, a lot of people ask me, how's this been? You used to be in a startup, now you're working for a big company. Well, um, one thing I've noticed is that there are uh, many more resources around in a big company, and uh, one of those resources is uh, of a legal nature, and so uh, out of an abundance of caution, I, I think I have to put this up for a few seconds. So, anyway, moving on. Um, so after, uh, after mentioning some of the background, I'd like to focus on, uh, on three statistical themes. So the, the first is um, various data structures for doing uh, quantile estimation. And in particular, I'll focus on a, a, a new version of a T-digest, which we've developed. Um, then I'll discuss the problem of undoing uh, sampling bias. Uh, and then I'll say a few words about ha how to handle non-stationarity uh, in, this, in this context. Okay. So as, as you've probably gathered from, uh, from some of the other talks at, at this conference and, 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 and other conferences, um, much of the world is, is moving towards uh, microservice, microservices architectures, which basically means that instead of an application being deployed as uh, a single monolith, it is broken up into little pieces that do some little subset of the work needed uh, to run the application. So some may uh, front databases, some may perform calculations, some may, uh, may operate the REST layer, um, but in general, this allows the different pieces of the application to, to scale as they need, rather than scaling the, the infrastructure, uh, rather than scaling all the infrastructure, and it's also kind of needed uh, to handle um, engineering teams that, uh, that are just working on some small piece. So there, there are many, many forces pushing us in this pushing us in this direction. Um, one of the challenges that arises is that uh, it is not so easy for a single person to reason about how work flows through uh, some of these more complicated architectures. And so uh, distributed tracing is, is generally viewed as a complement to uh, more traditional methods like logging and metrics as a way of offering insight into how work is flowing through a microservices architecture. Uh, and so I. Um, I also, I, I brought some, some traces with me, so, uh, so here's one. Uh, so each, uh, each horizontal bar is a, is a span that's basically a, a particular operation in a particular service doing some work. Uh, the duration spent uh, is, the, is the length of the bar. And then there are also parent-child relationships among the different uh, operations. So some services may call themselves and then eventually call other services. And in this case, the, the different colors represent, uh, that the, represent different services. So here the REST layer is doing some work and then it's asking analytics to, uh, to make a calculation. Uh, analytics has to set up a job and then eventually uh, starts, querying, uh, starts querying a, a time series service. Okay, so that's a little, a little chunk of a, of a distributed trace. Um, and then if you uh, zoom out a little bit, uh, it, looks, it looks like this. So, fascinating. Um, so a little, bit, a little bit more about the data model. So, the, uh, so uh, a span is basically, uh, consists of a start and end time, and then the service and operation that are involved in doing the work. And of course, these can be augmented with some, with some additional tags that, that capture some of the context of the execution. And there's also some identifier, uh, we have to do some accounting, uh, the parent ID, which allows us to construct a, a directed acyclic graph uh, from one of these executions, and also the ID of the containing trace. And so you can kind of think of this as um, an atomic uh, unit of instrumented code, and then uh, a trace is just a collection of these that share uh, the, same, the same trace ID. So this is a very brief introduction to, uh, to spans and traces uh, with, with some pictures. 
And so uh, one, one problem that arises, um, you know, some of, the, some of the larger tech companies that have implemented these solutions um, in-house uh, have, have noticed this. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, for large applications or applications that they handle a lot of traffic, this is just a very large amount of data and it probably doesn't make sense to store it all. Um, there are definitely cases when it makes sense to, to sample it down. And so this creates a, a, a problem which we can convert to statistics or data science, which is how do we decide which traces to keep? Okay. Any, any questions so far on the, on the context? Seems fine. Okay. Okay. So, so one approach is, uh, is to flip a coin. Um, probably everyone could have come up with that. Um, so you pick some probability, like you know, 0.1%, and you, you keep everybody with that probability. So uh, this does have some virtues. It's very easy to implement. Like No one's going to give a talk about this. Uh, it's very uh, resource efficient. Uh, it's very easy to reason about. Uh, so you can easily construct uh, confidence intervals, for example, if you, if you know the size of your sample. Right? There's no statistical algorithm to maintain in code. There's no issues with distributing this. It's dead simple. Um, but of course, the problem is that uh, most uh, executions are pretty uninteresting, and problems don't announce themselves at the beginning of the, uh, of the execution. Uh, they sometimes happen only, only towards the end, relatively deep down in the, uh, in the, execu in the, in the trace. And so uh, this is kind of kind of uh, clear, but uh, just for uh, concreteness, uh, I made an example, so now I have to navigate over. So this is, this is an actual trace. Let's see, is it gonna work? Okay, so this, uh, the database is making a bunch of asynchronous calls. Everything's totally fine, uh, executing quickly, no errors, and then all of a sudden, uh, out of nowhere, you know, there's a, one, basically, there is a, a, a timeout, and the, the gray bar timed out, and then the, the red bar, the, the, that uh, bubbled up to an error in the, in the calling operation. And so, uh, if you want to have a higher probability of keeping traces like this, uh, then you need to somehow bias your sampling. And this will require you to buffer the traces for at least some time, uh, because you don't know in advance whether this is going to happen. So you can't just flip a coin at, you can't just flip a coin at, the, at the beginning of the execution. Okay, now I have to navigate back over. Okay, that's the end of the end of the video. Okay, um, no sound. Okay, so instead we're, we would like to take a tail-based approach, which means that we defer the sampling decision until the trace completes. By the way, trace completion is not a well-defined thing, right? Spans complete, but traces don't actually complete. And then show a preference for uh, for interesting traces. Okay, and so what are some you know heuristics that come from uh, come from this business context? Uh, so what makes a trace interesting? Well, latency is interesting. So uh, a span or a trace that takes uh, longer than it's supposed to uh, is interesting, could reveal some problem. A uh, span or trace that has an error on it, especially if the error rate is generally very low for that operation or endpoint, uh, is interesting. Uh, the, the overall frequency of execution is interesting. So you know, the, the authentication layer may have a, a, very large volume of, a very large volume of traffic, but all of those executions are basically the same. We don't really need to keep very many of them, but relatively rarely used uh, services or operations um, may surface uh, more interesting patterns that would be hard to detect by a, by a head-based uh, sampling strategy. And then there's also some uh, interesting, uh, there are some interesting anomalies in the structure of a trace. So, uh, does this execution tend to have a particular graph shape? And then uh, if, it, if it doesn't, what does that mean? Or does the, does the vector of span counts tend to be in a particular location uh, in, in a vector space? And if we see a cluster uh, growing somewhere else, does that mean something about the, about the execution? And so the, the challenge will be to develop some ideas for tail-based sampling while preserving some of the, the virtues of head-based sampling, namely the, the ease of implementation, uh, the not using excessive resources, and allowing for the, for the calculation of, of summary statistics. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to communicate the, the main idea in a, a cartoon example. So uh, let's say we, we give ourselves a budget of uh, 30, uh, 30 traces to keep every minute. And we have uh, an application with three endpoints. Uh, get thing generally, generally receives about 1,000 requests a minute. The median, uh, the median latency is 300 milliseconds. Create has 100 with a median of uh, 400. And update has 10 with a median of 500. So uh, the idea will be to divide this budget up 
uh, with a preference for the infrequently used endpoints. So we have 30, let's give uh, 15 to get, 10 to create, and five to update. And then within each of them, we'll prefer the abnormally long or erroneous traces. So our target might be, for example, among those 15 we're gonna keep forget, forget, uh, let's keep three under the median and 12 over, for example. For the other ones, two and eight, and so on. Okay, so this is a kind of a, a cartoon of an algorithm. Um, so uh, in a little bit, uh, and we should do something similar for, uh, for error rates, but this is actually a bit easier because we don't have to track distributions, it just counts. Um, so in a little bit more detail, um, we'll form a sort of forecast for every endpoint. You can view this as a multivariate uh, forecasting problems, problem. So what is the expected volume of traffic I should receive for this endpoint in the next minute? Divide up the budget among them and then perform a kind of biased, uh, biased sampling for each endpoint. Okay, and so maybe I'll, I'll breeze through this rather than um, you know, use allocation by the sort of Senate or House rules, um, we'll apply a, a concave function to all of, the, all of the contributions and then divide the budget up that way instead. And so uh, one, one consequence of this uh, is that you can see parts of the, in some cases, you can see parts of the uh, microservices architecture that you may not otherwise have seen. So a common way to visualize a set of traces is to sort of glue all of the uh, dependencies together into a graph to see how, uh, to, uh, to see how the uh, data is flowing through it. And so uh, first, I'll, first I have here uh, the, uh, the graph corresponding, the, the graph made from a set of traces that were uh, sampled via the head-based strategy, so with some, some fixed probability. And then uh, taking into account the overall frequency of execution, uh, we actually discovered uh, a, new, a new service and then uh, a new dependency. So, um, of course, it's sort of easy to, to understand that this would happen theoretically, but it, it also, it happens um, in real life. Okay, so what we'd like to do to, to, show, uh, to show a preference for the, uh, for the uh, traces and, uh, for traces and spans that took longer than expected, we need to be able to answer questions like, how unusual is it for this operation to take uh, 250 milliseconds to respond? And so this demands a sort of uh, ranking data structure. So a data structure that can support CDF or quantile type queries uh, should be neutral and representative. So even if our sampling is biased, it should reflect, uh, it, it should have the, the correct values that reflect the, the overall population, not just those we decided to keep. It would be great if it had a sense of time, maybe some kind of a exponentially, uh, exponentially weighted structure. And of course, since, we're, since we want to make this scalable, uh, the data structure should be as small as possible. It should also be mergeable, so that if many machines are, are operating this, we can uh, glue the results together and still, have a, and still have a good estimate. And it should be able to operate incrementally, so we can incorporate uh, one data point at a time. Okay, and this, this leads us into the, into the world of, of data structures for online quantile estimation. Um, and so I'll just uh, briefly show how, how you would use uh, one of these. So if you, if you don't have one of these, maybe you are, you're allowed to keep uh, you know, 20% of a particular endpoint, you would sample like this. So the, the horizontal axis is the quantile space, sorry. Uh, if you know the median, maybe you would do something like this, show a preference for those that took longer. Uh, and if you knew the distribution itself or some approximation, then you could sample like this. So the, this is showing the, the probability of, of retention or the sampling probability as a function of the quantile. Okay, and of course, all of these will, will have the same integral so that they will overall keep, say, 20% of the, of the executions for an endpoint. Okay, and so if you use the green curve, uh, what do you get? Well, uh, first let's, so the, the blue curve is, uh, is uh, head-based sampling, and so if you, if you run this on a data set, you might get a distribution that looks like this, and if instead you use the green curve and show some preference for the uh, show some preference for the right side of the distribution, uh, then you would get something that looks like this. Okay, so the, the horizontal axes are almost aligned. Uh, the vertical axes are actually a little bit different. Um, so I, I will say these uh, distributions look sort of tame, but the, these, this is in uh, log log axes, and in general these latency distributions have uh, quite a bit of positive skew, uh, which, is, which is something we'll return to later. Okay, 
So there's a, there's a similar story for errors. So if you show a preference for errors, you can keep more of them. And so uh, since there are maybe some, uh, I don't know, scientists or, or mathematicians in the uh, audience, you're probably saying, well, thanks for the screenshots, um, but you know, why does this work? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about different data structures that can do uh, ranking. Okay, so, so one, one proposal, so without doing any ranking, one proposal would just be to, say, maintain a, a rolling mean and standard deviation and then make the, the sampling probability a function of the z-score. Okay, but this, is not, this doesn't behave so well for distributions with a lot of skew and possibly with a, a large chunk of outliers. So there's a way to extend this uh, to make it a little bit more accurate, um, and this is the so-called moment-based quantile sketch. So of course, if you have the first two moments, you don't know that much about the distribution. But if you know all of them, you can, re you can reconstruct the data set and therefore, uh, and therefore any order statistic. But you could do something in between, which is keep a handful of the moments and also some of the log moments. And then for all of the distributions realizing those moments, uh, pick the one with the largest entropy and use that to estimate quantiles. Okay, and this is the so-called uh, moment-based quantile sketch. And just like the, the, you know, using just the z-score, you're maintaining just a few statistics for each data set, and it's very easy to merge them, uh, so across time or, or across space. So, so this has some, has some good properties. Um, we didn't use this, but it's, it's something that's, that's out there. Um, another approach is to use uh, reservoir sampling. So to keep, uh, just to keep a sample uh, where the, the probability of being in that sample uh, depends on where you are in time. So if you're very recent, you have a high probability of being in the sample. If you're older, you're much less likely to be around. And then this device can be used to support uh, CDF and, and quantile uh, type queries. Um, so this is another option. Um, what, we, what we ended up using after some experimentation uh, is the, the so-called uh, T-digest of, uh, of Dunning and Ertl. And this is basically a form of a dynamic histogram um, so rather than specify the, the bins in advance, uh, the bins sort of adapt to the, to the distribution uh, as, the, as the data arrives. Um, and so I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time, uh, a little bit of time on this. Um, so this is, uh, you can think of it as maintaining a sorted list of centroids. And a centroid is a value and a weight. And this represents a, cer a certain number of points, weight many points, that are near value. Uh, there are other implementations, but you can you can think of this as uh, you can think of this as an implementation. And then, if you're asked to estimate a quantile, if you know the overall weight, you just sweep through the centroids in order, or maybe you, or maybe you do something more intelligent until you've uh, until you've accumulated that much weight. Okay, and so the the permissible size of a centroid is governed by a so-called scale function. So this is a, a non-decreasing function from uh, quantile space to the real line. And uh, the requirement is that if, uh, if, a, if a cluster occupies a certain range in quantile space, say Q1 to Q2, then the difference between uh, K of Q1 and K of Q2, so in other words, the length of the interval after you apply the scale function, has to be less than or equal to one. Okay, so it's telling you how the, how the cluster size is allowed to grow as a function of the quantile. And the idea is that you can keep uh, smaller clusters in those parts of the quantile space where you desire more accuracy and allow the clusters to become larger if you don't care about a particular uh, location in quantile space. Okay, so what are some scale functions? So let me disappoint you for a couple, uh, for a couple seconds. So how about 10 times Q? So this is just saying uh, keep 10 bins with roughly the same number of samples. Okay, that's what it's trying to do. Okay, not so interesting. Um, this is slightly more interesting, so now keep a, keep a thousand bins. Okay, it's gonna get better. So here, here are some other scale functions. Uh, so here delta is just some, some positive number that's kind of like the 10 or thousand in the previous slide. And the nice thing about scale functions like this is that they have, uh, they have variable accuracy. In particular, they are extremely accurate towards the extremes of the distribution, right? The, the, the clusters are required to be very small near the minimum and very small near the maximum. But towards the median, maybe we don't care that much about uh, the accuracy of our estimates or we care less. We want to spend less memory and less computation there. And so we allow the clusters to be larger. 
Okay, so these, are, these already appear in the, uh, in the original paper, uh, in the original T-Digest paper. Okay. Okay, and so uh, I mentioned before that the latency distributions have a significant positive skew, and this creates a desire to have uh, a data structure with asymmetric accuracy. So you don't really care what the difference is between the first and third percentile latency, for example, but you may care a lot about the difference between the 97th and 99th percentile. So that could affect whether or not you're in violation of an SLA, for example. Okay, and so if you're, if you're given just a single data set, uh, you, know, you can specify uh, your favorite scale function. Say, I don't care about anything less than the median. Give me one cluster. And I care, re I care really a lot about everything above the 90th percentile. And you can compress it uh, with respect to some scale function. The, the problem is that if you have two of these, you need to know that when you merge them, you will have the same error bounds on the merged result. And so uh, it actually didn't appear in the original paper, but in a follow-up paper, uh, Dunning proved that for, uh, for these scale functions and one other one, which is kind of similar to the log, um, to the logarithmic one, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have a digest uh, with respect to that scale function and you insert something, the resulting clustering continues to satisfy the, the size condition that the, the clusters have size less than or equal to one after you apply the function k. And uh, as a consequence, you can merge uh, clusters and retain the, retain the error bounds. Okay, and that's just saying this, so that if you can merge two, uh, you can get a digest on the union. And so the main problem is that when you insert something or when you merge two, the location of a cluster will change in the, in the union of the two data sets, and you need to know that its size doesn't grow too much as you slide along in quantile space. And so it is actually a, a, a property of the scale function that clusters continue to satisfy the condition that they're not too large uh, after insertion and merging. Okay, and so um, I, I, I felt this didn't have, um, or I couldn't find a proper uh, theoretical treatment, and so, um, I, I came up with a creative term, uh, decent, um, and a definition, which just means that the function itself and any positive scalar multiple uh, accepts insertions in the sense that if you have a clustering with respect to that scale function and make an insertion, the resulting clustering will continue to satisfy uh, the, the scale function, the condition imposed by the scale function. And this turns out to be equivalent to the condition that whenever you have a pair of numbers in quantile space, which you can think of as the bounds for a cluster, and a number alpha, which is gonna be the proportion occupied by the cluster you insert, that the difference between uh, the, the values, uh, the endpoints of the new cluster after the insertion, those are the primed ones, uh, is less than or equal to the difference between uh, the, the values of the original, uh, the endpoints of the original cluster. Okay, and there's sort of two cases, one is where you move to the right, the other is where you move to the left, but the, the techniques um, don't care too much about this distinction. Okay, so there's this characterization of scale functions that we can use, we can sort of use in a, in a mergeable and incremental way. Um, and uh, from this, you can actually uh, prove something about uh, scale functions. So uh, a decent scale function has to be continuous, um, in fact, differentiable. So this is my uh, cartoon of the proof that uh, continuity is required. So the, I don't know if you can see it, um, the, the black dots represent the uh, quantile bounds of a cluster before insertion, and the, the red dots have the primes, those represent the quantile bounds of a cluster after the insertion. And so the idea is that if you can, uh, if you have a point of discontinuity, then you just uh, imagine you have a cluster very close to that point of discontinuity, uh, where the difference between uh, K of Q1 and K of Q2 is very small compared to the difference between uh, the, the values, the, the right and left hand limits at the point of discontinuity, right? And then uh, you just make an insertion that pushes exactly Q2, but not Q1 over that line. And then the K of Q2 prime minus K of Q1 prime will be much bigger than K of Q2 minus K of Q1, okay? So, um, and there's kind of a similar argument for differentiability. You, you have to handle the denominator as well, and you can, and I, and I, I wrote this up. It's not fascinating, but it's, it's true. Um, and so um, this, this requirement that a decent scale function has to be differentiable actually suggests a construction, which is that, well, we want this uh, asymmetric accuracy. We care a lot about one side of the distribution and not the other. 
why don't we pick some point, like one half, uh, and uh, instead of using you know, this arc sign or log of q over one minus q, uh, take the tangent line of some point and extend the function that way, which is to say, use one of these. Okay, and so if you, uh, if you imagine forming a, a digest uh, on a data set with respect to either of these scale functions, you can see that the clusters will be relatively large uh, on the left-hand side and become progressively smaller as you move to the right-hand side. Okay, so, so that's, just, that's just a suggestion, um, and it, it turns out to work. So um, to, uh, to actually verify this, um, if you think about the, uh, the inequality involving uh, the Q1, Q2, Q1 prime, Q2 prime, if you sort of rearrange it, you can write it as a one-variable problem. You just have to verify that a, a couple of functions are non-increasing, um, and that you can do um, by calculus. Um, and I won't, I won't show you that. Um, uh, I will, uh, I'll show you some results instead. Um, and so the, it's actually sort of visible? Okay, that's a surprise. Um, so the, the top row represents the results of digesting uh, one million samples a um, hundred times uh, on a sort of traditional uh, t-digest using the log of q over one minus q scale function. And the second row represents the, the new version where we use the tangent line construction on the, on the left-hand side. Okay, so that, that explains the rows. So the first column represents the uh, error. So this is the difference between the quantile we're trying to approximate and the empirical CDF of the estimated quantile. And so uh, the, the horizontal axis, oh, that's, sorry, that's here. The, the horizontal, you can almost see it. Um, the, the zero is the median, uh, minus one and plus one are the 10th and 90th percentiles, and then 99th and so on. Um, and that's also, that also explains the horizontal axis in the, in the middle column. And so what you can see is that for the, for the log of q over one minus q, the sort of traditional uh, t-digest, uh, the, the error is symmetric uh, about the median. And if you normalize the error, which is to say divide it by the smaller of q and one minus q, uh, you, have this, uh, you have this nice shape in the, I guess, row one, column two. But if you instead use the glued version where you allow the clusters to become larger on the left-hand side, uh, you, uh, you have less accuracy on the left-hand side, which is uh, much more visible when you look at the normalized error. And of course, the, so you've lost some accuracy. Uh, you've pretty much kept the same accuracy on the right-hand side and you've kept many fewer centroids. Okay, and, and to, to first order, the number of centroids is what controls the, the memory consumption of, of one of these data structures. Okay, and, and actually, the, uh, it's kind of a, a side note, but you, you actually save some CPU as well, because when you do the merging, uh, you have to evaluate some transcendental function, and so now we only have to evaluate it half of the time, roughly. We have to evaluate just a linear function on the left-hand side, so some, some more some more engineering goodness. Okay, so this is kind of the end of the, the story with uh, asymmetric t-digest. Um, so this is the one, the one topic that I want to discuss in the most depth, and so maybe it's a good time to just pause for, uh, pause for any questions. I'm having a little trouble interpreting the graph on the right. The, the centroid. The centroid counts, yes. So, um, oh right, so I, I ran this experiment 100 times, and so the, on, on the uh, left panels, the, it's a box and whiskers plot from the 5th to 95th, and then the interquartile range, and the median is in orange. And then uh, in each of those runs, you get a certain number of centroids, and I'm just showing the histogram of the, the number of centroids. And so, uh, in this case, I used uh, delta equals 100. Um, so generally, the number of centroids is, is close, to, close to delta. And so if you use uh, the log of q over one minus q, you get, it looks like 70 centroids most of the time. Whereas if you use the asymmetric version and allow compression on the left-hand side, uh, you keep about, uh, you only have to keep about 40 uh, centroids. Yeah, so sorry, yeah, the horizontal axis on the rightmost column is, yeah, number of centroids in the data structure.
Okay, so maybe uh, should we discuss one more topic? What do you... So that, uh, as I explained to Mark, the talk is kind of designed, uh, it's easily uh, truncatable, so you can stop it at any point and hopefully it makes sense. Um, so there's another topic uh, which, we, which we can discuss. Um, uh, but once we start it, we have to finish it. Um, so uh, so one, one problem is that um, you know, when you intentionally bias your sampling, uh, you, know, you, you, you show a preference for the, the traces that took longer than you expected. Um, and then you, for example, calculate a percentile on that data set, uh, it's wrong. Um, and you would like to know what the baseline, uh, what the, the baseline actually is, and we, you would like some, some accurate characterization of the steady state. And so uh, the way we solve this is to uh, also record the sampling probability when we decide to retain uh, a trace. And so to kind of demonstrate how this works, um, you can imagine a, a generator spitting out examples from a distribution and recording the truth, a sampler that keeps uh, a biased sample, say 10%, um, maybe according to the, the green curve from some slides ago, and then you can compare these. Okay, so I take, um, yeah, there's a, there's a data set, um, very cool. Uh, there's a, a weighted sample uh, according to the green curve or something qualitatively very similar, so we, we really try to keep the, the long guys. Um, and then when you use the, if you record also the sampling probability, then you, you kind of have the same thing. And you show this to people and they're like, it looks great. Um, and you know, that's probably not good enough for you. Um, so uh, to just say a little bit about the quantitative methodology, um, one way to measure the difference between distributions is the relative entropy, which is kind of saying, uh, in this case, how much information do you lose if you pass from the full data set to the weighted sample that you've decided to retain. Okay, so it's, um, uh, it's, a, certain, uh, it's a certain integral. Um, this is, uh, by the way, a, a non-negative number and it's zero exactly when, uh, when P and Q are the same, which is to say the, the distributions are the same, and it's uh, not symmetric. Um, so then what you can do is uh, say, well, if I start with the full data set, and construct a uniform random sample with, with the same sampling probability, say 10%, I can understand, uh, I, I understand um, roughly how much information is lost, and I can compare that to the bias sample. So in other words, I calculate uh, first the, the relative entro entropy between the full data set, the truth, and a sample constructed uh, by sampling uniformly at random, uh, to uh, the, the relative entropy of uh, the relative entropy of the, uh, the full data set with regard to the weighted sample with the same sampling rates. And uh, what you'll find is that the, these distributions are very similar and you can actually see uh, where they disagree, right? Because this is kind of a, a function of uh, the, the uh, distribution function of the, of the full sample. It's an expectation uh, with, respect to, uh, with respect to that distribution. And this also allows you to understand uh, how the confidence intervals behave. Uh, in particular, uh, when you do this weighted sampling, your confidence intervals are relatively tight uh, towards the right-hand side of the distribution and, uh, and much looser towards the, the left-hand side of the distribution. But that's exactly what we want because we don't really care about those first percentile executions and those differences are, are very small in, uh, in, in relative terms anyway. Okay, so I think um, I think this is probably uh, a good place to uh, probably a good place to stop. Um, but I'll I'll stay if, stay up here if there are some questions, and then I'll I'll be available for uh, for a while on office hours, I guess. Do you have an example of a result when you calculate the Kovac fiber divergence? Like, like for example, the previous slide you had like an image where if you look at it, it looks very similar. But uh, no, I, I don't have I don't have any results for this one. Um, they are somewhere. They're just not in this. Uh, they're not in this slide deck. But what do you remember the, the kind of range of number? Because sometimes it's it's kind of uh, because of the log and things like that. Like it's it's. Uh, Sometimes even when they look very similar, like the number you get, like it's not so much uh, near zero. Yeah, so, so the numbers themselves are uh, small, uh, small positive numbers. Um, I know that's kind of a meaningless statement. I think this also depends on the units of information you use. Um, um, but they're relatively small positive numbers. 
So, so actually, there's a, yeah, there's a, the, the joke is that you calculate this for the, the weighted sample, and then you go to your product manager and say, I, I got a relative entropy of 0. 0.0001. Is that good enough? Right. That, that, that was the joke. <laughs> and you, ca you calculate it from the histogram. The, so, so in this case, we, um, so the, this is a, you can think of this as an expectation with respect to the, uh, the, uh, the empirical density of the full sample. Right? Cap capital, uh, capital and lowercase p correspond to the full sample. So you're kind of doing... Um, you, you an empirical distribution. You don't have like the, the continuous distribution. You cannot really do the, the integral per se. You, you do it as a histogram just by like adding the the area of the rectangle or something? Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, you do some numerical integration. Yeah. I mean, it, in fact, the, yeah, the samples are drawn from some fixed distribution, so you, you could do it as a continuous integral. I, I don't think that would change the results very much. Um, yeah, but so you, you basically calculate this for P is equal to the full data set and Q is equal to a random sample and compare that to P is equal to the full data set, Q is equal to the weighted sample. 